Good morning. It's Sunday, May 25th, and you're watching Discussion Points. It's your boys, Ryan Morris and Brandon Fleming. We're, We're in cahoots. You know, Brandon, they say the camera adds 10 pounds. Oh. But so does lifting mad weights ah, all the way into a powerhouse. Yeah, yeah and also uh, adds 10 pounds. Alright, that adds 10 pounds. Well, uh, try being married to a pregnant woman. That'll add you about 50. Okay. It's called sympathy weight. <laughs> you know who else I noticed, uh, in addition to me, bulked up quite a bit this, this offseason? I think I know what you're going to say. Is, is Nate Bruno. Oh, alright, that was When I first saw Nate Bruno, I was a little scared of him. Wait, when? In, in life or this week? But when I saw him a couple weeks oh, ago. Oh, opening yeah. day, like, absolutely. He, he, lo he looked intimidating, he looked exquisite. Yeah. Particularly, uh, anything? Well, he's a guy, he's a guy, we didn't even mention him on last week's show. He could reclaim his Italian Player of the Year uh, award that he's already won it twice. He would look he amazing in a white beater with sauce on the front. He wants that back from his brother. Nate Bruno, if you think about it, his career, it mirrors Justin Timberlake's in some ways. Mirrors? It does. Okay. Uh, well, you know, Ryan, I've always found myself to be an unofficial expert of everything Justin Timberlake, so I'm willing to hear your case. Yeah. Bruno and Timberlake, they both started their careers as teenage heartthrobs. Okay. Timberlake was in NSYNC. He had that, the, the big curly hair. Bruno, he had the nice, the long flowing mane. And, and, and young girls, young teenage girls loved them. Okay. Then, they, they went, uh, Timberlake went solo, hunked it up. Bruno went solo in the sense that he went to college and then traveled around the country with different jobs. Also has hunked it up. Okay. Both took long hiatuses from their, from their respective careers. Timberlake did not put an album out for seven years. Nate Bruno didn't play Frisbee for most of two years. These guys really resemble each other in, in ways uh, you know, you, that aren't necessarily apparent. You know, I think I'm, I'm, he comes home with a body like that, girls are going to be hanging all over him. Mm. Well, yeah, I think they were already before. That's not, that's not fair. <laughs> well, now they actually have something to hang on to. You know what I'm saying? They're going <laughs> to slide off his, uh, his teenage boy chest. Yeah, true. Um, you know what? I'll say this. I agree with everything you had said, but here's the thing. With, uh, when, when Nate Bruno goes away to California, sun, beach babes, bodies, I mean, he comes back to the Eureka Frisbee Club because it's, a, it's merely a step, I think, in his life. Okay. Um, what, what, don't confuse loyalty that, me, that many of us players have with us having nothing else to do with our lives. I mean, yeah. we play the Eureka Frisbee Club because there's nothing else really that's going on out there. We enjoy our time and we have an allegiance to it. Speaking of players who have it going on, uh, two, our two MVP finalists last week both had tremendous weeks, Mark Morris and Matt Maggio. What, okay. are, your, what are your words on that? Well, my words, my words on them. First words of all, uh, Matt Maggio, or as we call him now, Maggio, he has, this is his second consecutive opening day game where he's been on the MVP podium. And he barely lost it uh, by a slim margin to Mark Morris. Mark Morris, this is his first MVP win in like five years. That's hard to believe, but right. it's true. And he's tied Ryan Morris for most wins uh, among the Morris brothers. Yeah. For MVPs, right? Yeah. Maggio, the guy lays out a lot. I like his game. He's a, he's a game changer if yeah. he's, he's going to be here all year. Yeah. yeah. He runs a lot, in my opinion, like uh, Fred Flintstone before he would throw hmm. the, uh, the bowling ball. He twinkle toes, and then he just dies his body. Ah, uh, I can see. Okay, okay. okay. Two other players that may have st stood out in some way. Jacob Miller, young fellow from Cooperstown, very fast. Uh, he was an MVP in one okay. of the few weeks that he played last year. I can see this guy making moves up the draft boards this week. And also Nate Fredsel. Man, what a haircut on this young fellow. Now there's a guy who's looking like the contemporary Justin Timberlake. Short on the sides, swooped on the top. He's going to be able to swoon a lot of I'm, I'm, I would not be surprised if, uh, if, if the, there's a female group following of, of Nate Frenzel. Yeah? For the Yuga Frisbee Club. Okay. Kids got it going on. Much different game than his brother Larry. Larry more of a savvy thrower. Nate, uh -huh. very athletic guy. All right, you had a few more comments about a couple more players. Yeah, I wanted to point out the fact that we've, uh, we had some, some significant female performances this year. And this is not, uh, uh, rather an opening day. This is not to to diminish the, the female uh, effort on any given week in the Union Frisbee Club. However, Nicole Johnson and Jordan Heath, I think, had a really good showing. Nicole Johnson, she spent a lot of time on the ground on her knees, in a good way, picking up discs. She was picking them up in the bread basket, had very few, if any, drops. Got up, didn't make that classic mistake of getting nervous after making a great play and throwing it away. She held on to it. Jordan, as in the preseason games that she had played with this one, she also had uh, quite a few touchdown 
grabs. And in fact, got the game winner that sunk Hippos okay. in the second game. Now, you, we've, we've gone over a number of players that we thought played well in the first week. What about the general quality of the league as its whole? As a whole? <sighs> Opening day quality? Mm -hmm. I got to tell you, if, if I could put it in one word, it's lethargic. Ryan, in most professional sports, players come to opening day ready to play. They're at their peak performance, and they pretty much only go down from there with injuries. Utica Frisbee Club, on the other hand, I think they're waking up that day realizing that it's time to play Frisbee. They gain 15, 20 pounds from over the winter uh, in hibernation, and then they kind of lumber out there. They're sucking air on the sidelines. Yeah. And I, they I think play their way into shape. It's gonna, yeah, and they pretty much don't hit their stride until about the All Star break. So yeah, I, I don't want to peak too early. And by the way, I was in that group. You know, fatherhood has taken its toll on me in these last 11 days. Now, Coach, you're a man with a lot of opinions, and I'd like you to give one more opinion. What do you think about our process and procedures before the throw-offs now? Okay, I think I know what you're talking about. You're referring to uh, how we match up with people on the other side of the field. For a very long time, and I want to say this very briefly, Utica Frisbee Club has gone through a metamorphosis in many ways since we first started playing back in 2007 collectively as a group. And so we've, we've incorporated stall counts, and we've incorporated a faster uh, uh, way of playing, and we've gotten rid of a lot of the deep throws, although I've tried to hold on to that part of our history. And I think another thing that I see coming down the line, and I don't like it, I'm an old man, and old men don't like change, is the fact that we're referring to other people in our matchups by numbers, Ryan. Okay, and this has been a new thing. Now, we've got a lot of our players that are participating in tournaments in the offseason, and they pick this bad behavior up. My dog, she goes to my in-laws. She comes back, she's chewing on wood, she's jumping on people. It's like, where do you get these bad behaviors? You go to these other places, you pick up bad, bad behaviors, and I think that's one of them. Calling people by number. Who's got one? Who's got two? Who's got three? Utica Frisbee Club is known as a familiar family group of players. We see each other, we have vested interests in each other's personal yeah. lives, we hang out with each other. Call them by the name. I think right? in general, people are very impressed when you meet them and you learn their name and know their name. One of the most impressive things. But teach other people other, everybody else's name, and we know everybody's name. Tell other people, I'll tell your new people on your team who everybody else is. You know, one of our players, uh, one of our most consistent players as of late, Andre Short, I remember my first interaction with him, I said, who's got yellow shoes? He was wearing yellow shoes, and he yelled out, my name is Andre, I have a name. So there's a guy, Andre, he must really agree with me that you yeah, should be yeah. calling people at okay. least by their last name. Well, yeah. come to somewhere in the middle where you can say, who's got one, Fleming, who's got okay. two, Morris. Okay. Now, we did have a lot of, of new players last week and a lot of players in general and that led to 36 players total four teams of nine and then some, people, big numbers like some that people brought up some people brought up why didn't we go to six teams why didn't we have six teams of six but there's there's well, some I think I know why. About that. there's some conflict about that I know why I think you call a lot of the shots Ryan you do a lot of things it's the reason why some people I, I totally defense. completely completely slipped my mind last okay. week uh, in the in the fog of you know bears bears walking out of the woods uh, everything Across open on. fields on campus, college yeah. campuses, yeah. But where, when, when do, where, what number should that line be? How many people are you comfortable with having on your team? We're gonna have a text poll. We're gonna put the numbers up. Okay, on, but on, first on let's, the so let's try to give our own because this is our sure. show. We should give our own opinion on this. Sure. I think that first, personally, I'm an extremist. I don't like having subs for a few reasons. One. Because matchups become difficult. Who did you have? Who did you call, call on the sideline? Yeah. Not everyone's going to take the same breaks and the same sub times as everyone yeah. else. So it's difficult to maintain coverage of, uh, and matchups. The second thing is, I, I am Ameri I'm an American, and by nature, I want to be lazy. I want to take breaks. I want to take the easy way out. When I'm on a team where there are no subs, I don't have that option. Yeah. I can't elect to go on the sideline, chug air for an entire point. Sometimes that point's quick. Sometimes we're on the sideline for yeah. six minutes because yeah. it takes a long to get a point. So I'm for having seven players on the team, max, all seven of us play, no subs, so my magic yeah. number would be somewhere so around you, you, 28 players. After 28 players, I think yeah. we've got to start breaking it down. And then if we have five on five, I'm fine with that too. We'll yeah. just change the field, the field stuff. So, so you, touch, you touch the disc more, you play every possession, you, you run more, so you burn some more calories. Those are some of the positives. And there are negatives that are associated with it. I think some of those negatives are that third field is not very good. It's, there's some potholes, some divots in it. People don't like it, and it's not necessarily very big. You know, that's part Another of the bougie problem. attitude. It's one real quick yeah. mistake. That's part of the bougie attitude. We used to play, our forefathers played on cement, asphalt, sure. and now we're talking about some divots in the, in the grass, but okay. And then another problem is you get mismatches in teams. So when you have more teams, you have a bigger standard deviation in their ability, you get some mismatches. One game ends up a blowout. Another game ends up a, a long game that goes to, you know, 13. 
those guys who blew each other out or had the blowout, they're just standing around doing nothing for a half an hour. All right, well, if mismatches are your problem, stay tuned uh, for later in the episode. I think we may have an option to, to okay. get rid of that. Now. So what we want to do is we want you to uh, call or is a text poll. I don't know what it is. Right. You'll see it on the screen. We're going to right. organize it in a minute. How many people do you want on your team at most? Seven, eight, nine, ten? You got ten people, you're only playing about uh, two th two thirds of that game. You, you have that have 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 that ten, that, that's ridiculous. That, that, yeah. You know what? Someone's gonna vote for it. So yeah, it could be. Could now be. here's the other thing. Okay, we've discovered that in these text polls, you can vote as many times as you want to. So no, it's gotta be from a different number, I thought. Well, yeah, from from a homes. different number. So if you got if you got family out there, you know, yeah. if you got a mom and a dad yeah, and a brother know. and and maybe a few phones that you can text from, talk about Nick Bruno. Remember our, our poll last uh, last time? He okay. just really tried to phone it and he still didn't win. All right, we're gonna move on to our next segment now. Last week, we saw Oskanitz. They really controlled the the. the the run of play last week. They went two and zero. Okay. Hippos went zero and two. Okay. Looks so like you're teams, on track for your predictions, but I mean it's just one game. So not everything went right for Oskanitz. Nothing went right for Hippos. But what about those teams in the middle? What could they have done that could have possibly put them over the top? You know, Abaco went one and one. Matt Brewing Company went one and one. What could they have done differently? Coach, do you well, have any solutions? You know, I first of all, this is purely a means of, of just streamlining and being efficient. As a coach, as the coach in the Utica Frisbee Club, I'm often inundated with questions of how people, how players can improve, how teams can improve, how to uh, build uh, team unity and acting as one. I'm uh, either whether it's on the field or I'm out to dinner with my family. People are coming up to me and bothering me with this. I figured I'm just going to head it off before it gets to be uh, too big of, a, of an inundation on my life. And that's why we've come up with a new segment called Fleming's Fixer Uppers. Ryan, what I intend to do in this segment is people are going to ask me, coach, how they can improve some aspect of their game. Okay. Man, last week at Frisbee, we had a hard time getting, getting the game started fast. I mean, we fell behind five or six points before we even knew what was happening to us. I don't know how to start the game off fast. We got seven unique, unique and individual players. Just we gotta figure out how to make them melt at the same time. Coach, what can we do to spice Avico up and make this thing get off to a quick start as opposed to falling behind? Fast? Okay, you want to get off to a good start. I get it. Here's what you gotta do: deep bombs right off the bat, throwing deep. You get three or four of your guys. You run deep every single time. You draw the bomb each and every single time. The other team's gonna get in their head that you're gonna be going deep every single time, which for the most part will be true, but every now and then you'll have that, that time to throw one of those sissy shore passes, okay? You gotta intimidate the opposition from the get go. I've been a coach in this league for over eight seasons, trust me. I can dig it. Next question. Uh, matching up with those younger players last week. We seemed to run out of gas at the end of the second game. Coach, how can we fix it up? Okay, so we got a question about matching up with young, unknown, physical players. Alright, listen. First off, young players can be intimidating. Alright, I'm old. I know. They scare me too. What most teams would do is they would go for a physical option, like implementing a zone defense. What that does takes away the one-on-one -on -one mismatch, levels the playing field, gives rid of the blowouts, okay? You can do that if you're a sissy. What coach would do is this, okay? You gotta get psychological. You get a private investigator on retainer. You get a, you, the, once the team is set, you give your PI a call. You give them the names. Five minutes later, you get a call back. You find out that the opposition's got uh, parents who are alcoholics who beat them, okay? You go back to your car, you get a couple empty beer bottles, white beater, mess it up. Psychologically, you're in their head. They can't compete. They're out of the game. Okay? That's how you win games. I'm done. We're back from Fleming's Fixer Uppers. Hopefully, 
Avico and Matt have been fixed up for the future. We think they have been. We'll see what the results well, yield in the next few weeks. As long as they listen to my advice. I mean, from Jake Johnson's reaction, I don't think that uh, he agreed with my words of wisdom too much, but that's okay. As mentioned in previous episodes, Jake Johnson, he's almost ready for prime time, and maybe when he starts listening to some uh, coachly advice, he'll get to that point. All right, tonight, it's week two, Bank of Utica and Forest Hill Cemetery making their debuts. After the game, Memorial Day weekend, we usually go to Green Onion, usually. have a drink or two. And no, nothing crazy, you know, you're going to be hurting, you're going to be sore after the game, you don't want to get hammered. Thursday night, Saranac Thursday continues. We were there last week. New location within the brewery for us. Still just as much fun. A lot of thighs. If you're, if you're 21, come in see the thighs. If not, lurk outside with binoculars and check them out from there. Ryan, as a scientist, I'm consistently trying to find correlation factors. Uh, and, and in this instance... Having fun on Saturday night, Thursdays, I think I finally had it. We've changed positions. The location apparently doesn't have any effect. The two factors I think that do are having your boys present and having a lot of thighs present. You got those things together, you're going to be having fun on Saturday night, Thursday, whether you're on the other side of the fence with us or on the opposite side looking through the binoculars. More fresh thighs coming this Thursday. Oh, yeah. We'll see you later tonight. God bless. What is it with you and God? Okay, I still get jitters. Season 2, episode 2. Alright.